if we go into reality, then reality, and that's what I want to say, is not something that's there. Reality is something that has to be conquered, to be discovered, to be opened up. It takes time. But if you do so, you get contact with that. And only so you can fall in love with something. And your love for a tree makes you weep when the tree is gone. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings, this is Burn, the Anadromist, coming to you on this lovely pandemic morning here in Tbilisi, Georgia. And eh, it's time to stop talking about the pandemic and start talking about life again. Don't worry, I'll eventually come back and do more pandemic things. But uh, I, be I had a few things running around in my head that I thought I would get out. This is something I've thought about for many, many years. I think ever since I read, when I was a teenager, I read uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And when I did, he comes to a, sep a section where he talks about rival conceptions of God and things like this. And basically what he says is that when you boil things down, there's not as many views of God and such as one would think there are. And I've been kind of mulling this stuff over, you know, I'm 64 now, so you do the math, we'll say from 16, 17 years old, 16, to 64, um, fair amount of time. Um, so what I've come down to is I've thought, you know, essentially one could say there are as many different conceptions of belief and what people choose to believe in or don't believe in, as there are people who have ever lived in history. That is to say, every person has a somewhat slightly unique personal view or anti-view. And yet it strikes me when you boil down all of these perceptions, what people believe tend to end up in three, possibly four categories. And that's what I'm going to discuss today. Three, possibly four taxonomies. Uh, we'll call them, you know, labels, uh, identifiers of belief. So, uh, let me just go over them really quickly. Just name them to start with. And then I'm going to go back over them in different ways. The first one is that someone is there. There's a god or, or gods. But basically, there's something personal in the universe. The next one is, no one is there. There is no God. There is, you know, everything is here because it just somehow evolved or is just is. There is no explanation. There is no God. Number three, something is there. Uh, in other words, uh, there's some force or power or fate or something behind everything, but it doesn't have a name. It doesn't know our names. It's, it's impersonal. It's something to connect to, but it doesn't, it isn't like a belief in God. And number four, and this is the maybe one, which basically says, you know, stop wasting your time thinking about all these things because no one's ever going to figure it out. You know, we've had these questions for ages and no one can make a decision on it. So just keep working or playing video games or watching porn or go on vacation or look for a new romantic partner or, you know, sometimes it can be boiled down by people saying, you know, think of the little moments in life. So those are the three, uh, type, uh, four, three, possibly four types of belief. Someone is there. No one is there. Something is there, and why are we wasting our time talking about this? And the more I've thought about it, the more number four strikes me as an actual position of belief, and we'll talk about that. So let's go back over them a little more. View number one. This says we are not alone in the universe. Someone knows your name. 
There is a God or gods. There is a reason for personality, since it is a reflection of an eternal personhood. Obviously not a personhood in the sense that I am a person. That is, say, not that isolated and small. People often say, yeah, God's just this big man. It's Michelangelo's David, the old man in the beard and such. Uh, but, you know, people say we anthropomorphize belief. Uh, we say, you know, God's like a man. I say it's absolutely the other way around. Man is like God. That is why we have a personality, a unique essence, a character. So we, our personhood is a reflection of a much greater personhood, a, con a, a conception of personhood that would include well, not only my personality and your personality, but all the personalities who have ever or will ever exist including all the personalities of animals, all the specific uh, aspects of nature in the universe. Because all of those specific aspects and characteristics are part of personhood as well. Uh, they're obviously not the same as my personal consciousness. But I'm talking about that specific, unique, you know, my name is Burn, Burn Power. What is your name? That, you, you know, as soon as I give you a name, you are a person. You know, prior to that, you're just waffling around. When I, I have cats running around out here, I've given them all names. Why? They all have, like, slightly different characters. I have one cat that goes to the window. I call him Mego because Mego Barty is the Georgian name for friends. I have another cat. I call him Psycho because he acts really psychotic. And then there's another one that makes him look really normal. I call him Scrapper because he's, like, a super young kitten but will come screaming after all the food. These cats all have different aspects to themselves, different personalities. So personhood, personality is something much bigger than I am, but it is not, uh, so it relates to me, but at the same time, it's much bigger than me. I am a reflection of, one could say, the divine personhood. And the Abrahamic religions fit in here. Uh, but then again, so do some of the aspects of the old nature religions. Even in pantheistic religions, uh, you'll often hear people talk about God. There is a desire, you know, it's, it's very hard for us to say there is no personhood. Uh, next, view number two. There is no one there. And so basically all that there is is what can be weighed and measured. Everything can be seen as evolutionary products based on material causes of the physical universe. There is no why. Why is a question that someone invented and we get tripped up on it. Although it's kind of fun. You know, these people won't say, yeah, we have fun doing these things. It's kind of all fluky why this is happening. And essentially, these people will look at the belief that there is no God as an evolution out of the superstition of belief in God. All belief is essentially an illusion we use to prop up our essentially selfish motivations, uh, which are based on chemistry, genetics, societal conditioning, on and on and on. So that's the view. There is no one there. That That is to say that... And so... You know, it takes a bit of courage to believe that because, you know, there's a lot of you inside that wants to say, oh, my life is so purposeful and meaningful. View number three, something is there. There is a force, an energy, fate, but it doesn't have a name. It is essentially impersonal, but one can connect with it. Uh, which could be done through various religious, spiritual, chemical, even physical methods. In some views, for instance, in Eastern religions, it is essentially uh, life is about passing through the illusion of matter and desire to achieve a state of consciousness, which is bliss or emptiness to see through everything. It's all a matter of perception. In other views, like Taoism or dualism, there are two forces, a yin and a yang, which are in equal competition with each other. Can I do this? 
yeah, well, whatever. Uh, I'm not very good with uh, hand. Yeah, I am pretty good with hand gestures. What am I talking about? Let's try, see if I can get this right. Yeah, there you go. The yin and the yang. But it can also be seen as black and white. Uh, in some cases, good or bad. But uh, that's probably a little too personal. Um, it is often said that one should connect with the light. And then there's another view, uh, it, there are different views of this impersonality. There's another view that sees that one can connect with this force or power uh, through direct acquisition of knowledge, often secret knowledge, or a technique. But the important thing about all of these views is that what lies behind everything is at core impersonal. So that is something is there, but it's like something you can connect to much like you connect to electricity by putting a plug in the wall. View number four basically says, don't waste your time. Essentially, this view says that we are too small to know anything, really. And we can enjoy the smaller things in life, but don't get hung up on the bigger issues that we should uh, keep our heads down, lest we be picked off by the absolutism of those people who believe in God and truth and all of that. And sometimes the atheists are the ones who believe in truth. You know, the truth of nothing being there. Uh, we also don't want to be uh, sidetracked by the hopelessness of the atheists. So we're keeping our heads down. We're not asking the bigger questions. We're enjoying the little moments in life. One could call this the French view, and I don't mean it in terms of like Jean-Paul Sartre or existentialism or anything. I mean like, you know, let's get some wine, <laughs> you know, let's have really good food, and let's just enjoy this. Let's enjoy an interesting argument or conversation. Although many people, it's like, well, arguing is already a problem because, you know, but that's the people who want to connect more. Also, these people don't want, generally tend to avoid what they would consider the spiritual mumbo jumbo of like the, the New Agers and such. They're not into all that positivity and whatnot. They're just trying to be themselves, whatever that means. Um, Postmodernism is probably much closer uh, to being the intellectual flag of this particular view than any other because it essentially says, one can't really know any of the narratives very well because there are so many competing narratives. And therefore, <clears throat> how can you really know? So it's like this, uh, and there are many philosophical schools that kind of ended up here, which is why this really is a viewpoint that one can hold, this idea that you're just too small to know anything. Each view has its strengths and weaknesses. For instance, in view number one, there is someone there. There is God. Uh, the strengths are you have a reason to act morally because your character is a reflection of God's character. And all character is meaningful and one should be respectful. Relationship is really important because uh, of the morality of our relationships. That is to say, to break a relationship is a bad thing. Uh, there's a sense of purpose then. Uh, there's a reason why personality is meaningful. Not merely the result of conditioning, but unique, meaningful, meaningful in, and, and it's meaningful in nature, leading eventually to even the rise of science. Science, in this view, would come out of the fact that we know that the world is meaningful. Therefore, we can investigate it and open it up. The weaknesses, though. Uh, well, let's start with hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a huge weakness of people who say they believe in a God and believe in truth and believe in all these things because they'll say what one thing and then do another. And many people will say, you know, uh, the people I know who say they believed in God acted like that. So, yeah, hypocrisy. Also, a sense of purpose put into the wrong place. In other words, sometimes people will take that sense of, yes, there is a purpose. God has given us a purpose in life. And then put it into a cult leader. Or put it into repetitious rituals. Or put it into 
a building or put it into the American way of life or put it into, you know, whatever. In other words, it's easy to attach the purpose that comes from there being a God and attach it to all sorts of other things. Uh, there's also an absolutist approach to truth that can leave the believer convinced that they and their group alone possesses the truth. Thus, the endless division of denominations, sects, cults, even among those in the same religion. Uh, there is a sense that there are no more questions beyond the certainties of faith, and there's kind of a closed-mindedness in many quarters to real questioning. An unwillingness to entertain the lives of those living outside of the faith is having the same kind of validity, except as they can be converted. And there's a temptation to see the earth as just being for use only, not for appreciation, although one would think. It, it, you know, if, if one believed in God, then the world should be a place one can appreciate the beauty of. Nevertheless, many of the people who say they believe in God tend to also think, well, you know, uh, God gave us this to simply use and not necessarily to see the beauty of. So those are some of the weaknesses, I think, of view number one. Okay, the strengths of view number two. And you may notice, now I believe in God, but I think each of these positions has a strength. Otherwise, people wouldn't believe these things. And uh, the strengths of view number two is an honesty to confront the cold truths of reality. You will indeed die in the forest without being cared for by pixies or divinities or fairies or something like this. Um, prayers during a bombing raid aren't going to make the bombs turn into butterflies. They're going to fall. And likewise, during this pandemic, there are people who are, who are just simply putting blanket prayers out, God stop the pandemic or God protect us, not realizing, hey, that's not the kind of world we've been given, no matter what you believe. Uh, it's not a world where God's a magic uh, genie who makes things disappear. You get a certain amount of wishes or something like that. But people who don't believe in God realize this very well, that, you know, anything can pick you off at any time, and there's no reason for it. Now, I would say it's much more complicated than that, but nevertheless, to know that when you're out, say, hiking through the woods or driving down the road and you see an accident, it's not that that accident you see on the side of the road can happen to you. It really can, no matter who you are, because we're put in a world where there are laws of physics and gravity and things like this. And, and so, you know, if a certain amount of uh, velocity strikes an in inanimate object, bam, uh, no matter who's in that car, something's going to happen. Um, in a way, for the, the hardcore atheist, life is a lot like a film noir movie. That is to say, and, and film noir to me represents uh, a certain kind of artistic realism that comes from this kind of atheist perspective, this hard-boiled kind of like, it's just matter perspective. And, and that is to say, you never know when things are going to trip you up. You can't uh, depend on people. You never know what's motivating people psychologically, these kinds of things. But I think that's to know that, to understand, for instance... It, it, to me, if a person is naive, thinks everything is good, goes to New York City and meets real human predators without any sense that these real human predators exist, you it's much better to be someone who understands, yeah, ooh, yeah, the world is full of real dangers and I am not just divinely protected everywhere I go. Um, also, uh, atheists tend to have a real openness to scientific investigation. Uh, you know, they're, they're willing to look at the newest uh, uh, research related to certain fields, up to a point. And that point is, as long as it relates to the physical universe. And as soon as anyone suggests anything that this might suggest something beyond the physical universe, they tend to shut that down. But uh, nevertheless, uh, they also have a good acknowledgement of the animal nature of human beings. And I think that's uh, a very, very important thing for us to have. I think that's a very good thing to have, as long as it's not the only way you look at human beings. It's just 
essentially glorified animals. Some of the weaknesses of the second view. Having no answer for anything considered spiritual, not contained within the narrow confines of matter. What does faith mean? What is personality? What is consciousness? What are words? What about God? You know, forget that. You know, that's just a superstition. That's the only way you can look at it. You know, what does music mean? Uh, that's a really tough one. <laughs> you know, why do we react to certain patterns of notes? And why is that reaction fairly universal? Um, is it just a physical thing? I don't think so. That's one of the reasons why music has been such a powerful motivating force for people over time. Um, they also tend to ignore any scientific evidence that might lead to non-physical conclusions. Um, they have to kind of consider everything that is meaningful and human, in other words, things like beauty, music, art, even basic human conversation, as to be either essentially a fluke or there is... Uh, no, there certainly is no spiritual explanation for it. Um, you know, conversation tends to be like lab rats pushing on pedals to get to, you know, uh, something out of the other person. Granted, there is a lot of selfishness in everyone, but also granted, we also know selfishness is wrong. That love is very important. So, you know, uh, essentially, all the things that are meaningful in the world have to be some sort of almost coded uh, uh, illusion. So, view number three, the strengths of seeing that there is something there. Um, seeing a connectedness to everything. Uh, a lot of people who have this view of, you know, this kind of spiritual but not religious view, but that's that's probably, that's that's a little unfair. We'll call it this view that there is, you know, something to connect to, something beyond the human, but it has no name. It has it? It's 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 more like a force or a fate or a power or an energy that one connects to, so that everything that is seen is connected. Uh, there's an interweaving. This is why there is often a connection in at least the New Age uh, West between the idea of an expanded consciousness and many ecological issues. Because if everything is connected, you know, it's a tragedy, what we've done to nature, because we have disconnected ourselves through technology and commercialism and capitalism and all this stuff from uh, nature, and that's not a good thing. Um, also... If it is all connected, we must nurture those connections. So a desire to, to honestly foster those connections in the world. So again, an emphasis on, on kind of the, the us-ness, the we, the, all of us together in this. <clears throat> there is also more of a sense of discipline. And you need discipline in order to perform the spiritual techniques, the rituals, to go to the classes, in order to find that sense of connection. And, um, and it's, a, it's an or, a sense of order that uh, sometimes you find other people just don't have because it's like you really need to get centered with things. So you need uh, spiritual practices like yoga or something like this to focus you in and to eliminate the distractions in order to find more of the harmony and everything. Now, there are, of course, weaknesses in view number three. There is a desire to avoid conflict, especially with those who would interfere with one's journey uh, to in attempts to connect. Uh, in, in other words, you know, the one person that a lot of people I know who are kind of like trying to connect to this broader, higher force or whatever it is, want to avoid, they want to avoid rednecks, <laughs> you know, they want to avoid people who just kind of live for the day and don't really think about anything. They want to avoid people who would try to change belief structures like Christians or, or even uh, Islamic folk. Uh, they want to simply, they want everything to get together more like Hinduism than they do to have separate, discrete 
uh, zones of truth. Um, essentially, personality becomes an illusion or extens extensions of the universal self. So there's this idea that, uh, you know, if you really follow this out to its furthest conclusion, if you connect with it, the power of the force, what's beyond us, that you lose your, you, you subsume your personality within the totality. And I think that is a great problem because what essentially you're saying, and, and, the, and this is the temptation, particularly in the West, I think it's a little different in the East, but in the West, the, the temptation is to say, you know, I really have to get myself together. I don't have time for all this stuff that would distract me and annoy me. So it's like, putting aside the stuff that not seeing the beauty in the darkness in a sense, um, uh, uh, the beauty in the chaos, because the chaos ultimately has to be resolved into this one, you know, this pleasant one, supposedly. But uh, also the force, the energy or fate or whatever it is, it seems more like an electrical outlet than it is a relationship. So again, it's clearing everything out of your way to get the power. That's a problem because essentially, if everything becomes, if, if we're all connected to this big one, essentially everything is an extension of myself. Which means it opens the door for a lot of selfishness. Um, also, it's hard to prevent the language of personhood from creeping back in. And you can really see this in the West uh, that there are really good reasons for doing all of these things. Well, in fact, if everything is an illusion, there aren't good reasons. It's just one has to try to strip away the things that lead to desire, the attachment that leads to desire. One has to strip it away to get back to it. And it becomes a matter of plugging in. And basically anyone who doesn't really make one feel good should be kind of like, shunned a bit. Okay, what are the strengths of view number four? I think the, the main strength is humility. There's indeed much we will never understand. And sometimes the atheists and the uh, people who believe in God act like they know way too much. Um, the, the, uh, the other people, the people who tend to believe in something or force or power, tend to have this kind of like almost smug, like, yeah, we know. Whereas the person in, in view number four is basically like, hey, I'm just this one person among billions. What could I possibly know? Um, which, which is kind of a humility I can understand. There is a lot of truth there. Uh, oops, truth. I said truth. Oh, 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 wait, we can't really use that in this view. Uh, no, it's really teeny, small t truth. There is indeed much we will never understand. We certainly are small in the face of the cosmos, of history, of all the knowledge that one could possibly gain. Uh, many times folks from other views really do seem to be too full of themselves, too bleak, too trippy, you know. Um, there's an emphasis here on the common sense. As Owen Barfield says, well, what does that mean? What is common sense? What is the thing we all hold in common? Because I can tell you, living in a different culture from my own in Georgia, what is considered common sense is very different from what's considered common sense back in the USA. Um, and if the postmodernists are right, then we really can't be get beyond uh, all the different types of narratives and spin and interpretations and myths. And each thing is just a comment on a comment on a comment. So, maybe the best thing to do is, maybe the French have it right, you know, get the best cheese, the best wine, learn to cook right, enjoy, you know, life. Go, go out, take really good vacations, you know, really spend time uh, getting away from things. But, do the French have perfect lives? No. <laughs> so, so much for that illusion. On the other hand, maybe all the Fans and geeks are right. You know, find something, something you're passionate about. Uh, horror films or, you know, anime or uh, sports or, 
you know, uh, food, you know, or, uh, you know, pottery or, uh, you know, get interested in some scientific aspect, read more books, uh, you know, take better vacations. And maybe that's just all there is that that just to have experiences. And at the end of your life, you know, chalk up how, how good your experiences are. That's what seems to be the implication from our social media. People take photos of themselves in different places and say, I was here, you know, here's, here's me standing on a mountaintop. Here's me in having a meal in Italy, you know, it's just, and that somehow just doing those things will make us feel like, oh, what a, what a meaningful life. But, you know, if, if this last view is correct, then that's all there is, is just to enjoy things and don't sweat the big stuff. Uh, like the Iris Dement song was, uh, let the mystery be. But there are weaknesses to this view as well. Uh, you know, or maybe it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> that is to say, you know, uh, if, if all this stuff, uh, is just like, you know, we're too small to worry about it. Well, maybe all the stuff, the other stuff we use to distract ourselves doesn't matter at all. Literally. You know, it doesn't matter if you have all the uh, first editions of Harry Potter. It doesn't matter if you've collected baseball cards all your life. And, and trust me, these things really on, on, a, on a certain level don't matter. I mean, they're nice, I suppose, but they don't matter. They're, they're not the kind of thing that one's life is based on. Uh, you know, and why not impersonal sex? And why not drugs? And why not porn? And why not drinking? And why not money? Just for money's sake. Why not gambling? Why not more kitsch, more plush toys? You know, why not go back and try to get all the beanie babies there ever were? You know, uh, why not dress up like a furry animal and form some ironic cult around a show about little ponies? And there is a problem with everything we do. No matter how innocent, no matter how vacuous our... our uh, Hobbies seem to be, or, or, you know, no matter how cool, uh, you know, our little collections and little, you know, uh, playlists on Spotify are, there's always something in them that keeps reminding us that there's more to life. So, you collect books. What are those stories about? Give you a hint. Those stories are about life, good and evil, things we don't understand, death. <laughs> so, yeah, there is always something to remind you that your idea of like avoiding all of the big issues is never going to work, you know, especially when a relationship blows up in your life, when there's a, a war or, oh, a pandemic, <laughs> you know, uh, these things will just break your house of cards. And these folks essentially have the least artillery, uh, the least defense against the, the, the tank of life that rolls through and just suddenly crushes everything. And that's how things happen. Okay, now let's look at how these four views tend to look at love. In view number one, love has meaning because there is a creator, because personality has meaning. Uh, it's not a fluke. Our relationships in life are central to the meaning of existence. Uh, the problem here is when a person becomes betrayed or seduced or fall into some kind of romantic trap. Uh, and, and it brings the question of why do human relationships, particularly love and sexual relationships, affect one's belief in God so much? I'm not going to try to answer that question right now. But I think it is a massive question. So many people I know have been tripped up on any sort of belief in God, not because they suddenly said, oh, there is no God. We're making this all up. No, they get tripped up because they're tripped up in their human relationships. They're tripped up in, in the poverty of their family life. They're tripped up in the chaos of their work life. They're tripped up really in, you know, love and sex. And when these things fall, someone you put so much faith on betrays you. Suddenly, you tend to look at the whole universe as being a betrayal. 
Why does that happen? I give that back to you to think about. View number two. If there is no one there, love is essentially a purely selfish, chemical, genetic affair. Romantic love is complete delusion. You know, it's just us having read far too many poems and stories and, and rom-coms and all of this. Uh, so there can be deep con human connection, but why? Why is it important? Uh, love is important, but there's no reason why beyond the essential flukiness of it. Essentially, we are alone. Now, I've had very good friends who are atheists, and we've had these discussions, and they just say, my relationships are just really important. And, I, you know, it's just like, you don't have to uh, believe in God to see that love is important. And I would totally agree. But not for the reason they're saying. Not, it's not a, something that can be generated out of the fact that the universe is essentially meaningless. And I'll get to why there is this suspicion that love is coming from somewhere else in just a moment. View number three. Love can be seen in deep connection uh, as long as it doesn't interfere with the path of the person towards this connection. In other words, as long as the love is a part of everything moving together towards this connected uh, uni view of the world where essentially one you know, well, at a certain point, though, if you're dropping, particularly when you get to the phases of these things where you drop your personality, now you've got a real problem with love. What is love, then? Um, and also, well, we'll get to this in a moment when we talk about evil. So essentially, in love, the idea of sticking with a difficult relationship has become harder and harder the more we have kind of taken this a variation on the view that it's just like the universe you know i mean people now t use the phrase the universe they use the phrase the universe as the universe wanted me to do this which i look at as like the irresponsible person's view of god see the universe wants me to do this hold on <laughs> If the universe wants you to do it and you're connected with the universe, wait a second, there's a whole connect problem here. If it's this thing, the universe, but it wants you to do something, wanting, pushing, motivating, direction are all personal attributes. You're talking about God, you just don't want to. So, if the universe wants you to, do, to be in love, that's great. But, it, you know, just believing in the universe and not believing in there being a God who holds you responsible for your actions is a great way to get out of relationships that, quite frankly, suck. <laughs> so think about that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like we've entered this world where people can shed their relationships much more easily than they ever have before. Ah, we are the world, so to speak. Well... Um, finally, in view number four, well, you know, love is fun, you know, love is like a Disney film, <laughs> you know, it's just this thing, or it, love is like a porn film, it doesn't really matter, love is cute, love is just sex, love is whatever, there's no answer for it, you know, don't sweat it, don't get obsessed over it. You know, uh, there's, a, there's another book you're going to read that's going to tell you more about how to handle these relationships. Deal with the details. Don't think about the big picture. Just keep your head down. Avoid the bullets of meaning, the bullets of hopelessness, the bullets of trippiness. Avoid them. Keep your head down. Keep working. Take a vacation. Try Tinder. Love. Now let's talk about the different views and how they handle evil. The subject of evil. In view number one, evil is related to character and the breaking of relationships. So even in nature, evil is related to the breaking of our relationship with things around us. In other words, 
The evil in our relationship to the ecology has to do with the fact that we have broken our relationship to nature by not appreciating it. Evil is essentially selfish. It's bringing everything back to the one personality I think matters, me. And that would be a pretty good definition of evil. Is, is that essentially I want praise. I want people to understand me. I want people to love me. Which is really ironic because evil and love are actually much closer than people understand. Because we all want, we all want love. And I'm convinced that the more we want it, the more evil we become. You know, the more we say, people, if people could just see me, just me, <laughs> you know, me, me, and suddenly the world's you. So, uh, evil, selfish. Evil is also a choice towards the self. Uh, it is also a disregarding of the others. Evil brings everything back in. It's like a vortex. It's like a bottomless pit. It's like a black hole. It's like the maelstrom circling in to you. And in the end, uh, interestingly enough, evil is also related to loneliness. In the end, you are left alone because you get what you really wanted. I mean, there's that old Rolling Stones song, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you can get what you need. I find it's actually exactly the opposite. You can't really get, you know, you, it's really tough to get what you need because, you know, it's, it's around you and it's trying to break through to you. But if, but what everyone gets, they get what they want. And what do they want? Stop telling me what to do. Just let me figure this out. Quit bothering me. Okay. You can now have what you really want yourself. Um, evil in view number two is essentially has to be caused by sociological conditions, by accidents, by breaks in the gene pool, by greed. Um, but essentially, there's no really such a thing as evil. There's almost always a good explanation. I remember talking to a woman back in Alaska. Well, I wasn't talking to her. I just overheard her talking. She was talking to some other people. And she said she didn't really believe in evil. She believed essentially it was just all accidents. That that and to which I I sat there and said, Oh, really? Like there aren't people who who don't choose bad. I mean, you've never met this person. Well, essentially you see, there are evil really is a choice, I think. And it's sometimes a really teeny choice towards the self over the other. Um, but, you know, I'm just sitting there going like, man, this person has no imagination, even though she was a writer, because she can't see, you know, the mind of a torturer. But the mind of a torturer is very similar to the little decision you make to cut in line. You know, that's just a teeny thing. But it's eventually reflected way back you know, why do have so many atrocities been committed in war? Or, to put it another way, why did we choose plastic bottles over glass? You know, me, I want, it, I want to make more money. I want to live a more convenient life. I, I, me. And, but but in, in, at least in the view of evil in view number two, they acknowledge it. They may not know the, if evil is a real word, but they know there's some really bad stuff. Whereas actually, this person was more in view number three that I just described. That evil is mistaken perception. Uh, the person who commits what people call evil acts basically has bad per connect, uh, bad perceptions of life. If they could just see better, squeegee the eyes, you know, get the third eye polished up, they they wouldn't commit evil. Now, there's something to be said for that. You know, if you knew more, you probably would could see, for instance, that my uh, cutting in front of someone in a, a car on the road could cause that person an extra amount of fear or something, which wouldn't be a good thing for them. You could, you know, see yourself in this kind of moral perspective. But, the, you know, to see everything a bit better. But but it's still, you grind down on, you know, Genghis Khan saying, yeah, what is the joy in life? Is to be leaving a village, to watch it burning, and to see all the women having been raped. Okay, stick that into your perceptions idea. 
you know, well, if only the Mongols would would have just had an idea, you know, if they could have only seen what they were doing wrong, I'd go like, no, you're missing the fact. Some human beings can become predators, you know, and that's not a good thing. Um, you know, ask Ted Bundy. Uh, again, the answer to all of this is spiritual techniques or chemicals, maybe, you know, to, I, you hear a lot of talk these days about people and, and perception. If only you get their perception right, to which I'm sitting there going like, you know what? It doesn't matter about your perception. I mean, yeah, it's helpful to see things as they are. But what matters is your choices. What matters is whether you're bringing things towards you or you're doing something for anyone besides yourself in this world. Um, and, in fact, there's another problem here. And that is, you know, when you think about the yin and the yang and the different forces, the black and the white, the light, you choose the, the light side of the forest, Luke. Why? Why choose the light side of the force? There's no answer within this thing mentality of why you should choose the good. Why not choose the bad? And, in fact, there have certainly been people, particularly in uh, what are called the left-handed paths, who have chosen things like power and, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the belief structure of Aleister Crowley was, was totally, it's about me. It's about what I want. You know, and that is the dark side of the force, you know. So, you know, there is no reason within the structure of believing that there's a, a, you know, like a force or something to connect to. There is no reason why you shouldn't choose the dark. And in fact, if one wants a life-changing, altering uh, perception experience, some of these darker sides, they're much quicker, <laughs> you know, whether it's whipping yourself or whether it's actually committing horrible acts, the consciousness that goes on there, um, they say that, you know, the, 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 the person who understands another more than anyone else is the person who murders that person. I'm just saying, I'm not saying you should murder anyone. You shouldn't. It's evil. But what I am saying is, don't discount the fact that there are powerful psycho technologies on the dark side. Really, really powerful ones. What do you think your consciousness is going to be when you come out of an orgy? You know, you're going to see the chaos of the world in a much different way. Your your perceptions will be changed. So, uh, and then finally we come down to our dear friends who just don't want to think about anything. Number four. Evil. Yeah, maybe. Whatever it is, life can get pretty weird sometimes. All I know is when someone gets hurts me, I want to get back at them. In other words, they have no answer whatsoever. Because unless you've really thought about this stuff, I mean, I have had, I have experienced some things in my life that are pretty darn evil in all sorts of modes. And the only thing that keeps me from following after it in a state of blind revenge or terror or fear is knowing that love is more important and that I have to, you know, it's like being able to put myself in their shoes and see out of it, see the fears that are motivating them, to not follow down the hole after them, which is what evil always entices you to do. Now, one thing is I've, I've kind of made it sound like all these views are really separate from each other, that, you know, there are just people who believe in God, there are people who don't believe in God, there are people who, you know, believe in some sort of uh, cosmic entity or force, and then there are people who don't think about this stuff much at all. But, in fact, they're all mingled and uh, with each other and tempted by each other in each person. That is to say, these are states inside of us as well. So, a person can state with conviction that they do or don't believe a thing, and yet be haunted by the suspicion that maybe something else is true. Uh, so, um, it's interesting that what people believe, or at least what they say they believe, is not what they actually believe. And what I mean by this is, or, or what's motivating them. And what I mean by this is that, um, you know, a person can say, I believe in God. And then you look at them, and you look at their lives, and you realize, yeah, 
Uh, they live pretty much most of the time in category number four. That is say, they say they believe in God, but most of the time they spend they spend keeping their head down, avoiding uh, as much as they can about thinking and life, and you know their their religion is kind of thin, you know. Um, so really, they're more in category four. No matter what they say they believe. It would be nice if they did believe in God. But there's an awful lot of people who just kind of believe in getting by each day. Conversely, I've seen atheists who rail so hard against God that uh, methinks they doth protest too much. In other words, they're, they're talking about the world as being unfair. Hmm. Well, it could only be unfair as if you have an idea of fairness... And if you don't think there's a God, where in the world is that going to come from? Ah, you see, you do think there is a God, but you think God has been unfair. Mm. You see, that's a different sort of situation altogether. And Nick Cave is a good example here. If you go, uh, Nick Cave is a great singer. Love Nick Cave. Uh, I've been listening to Nick Cave since the Bad Seed days back in the early 80s. And Nick Cave's music sounds... It, it, he's got some songs there, like, uh, oh, I, I, you know, like Sonny's Burnings, the first words of the song are, hands up, who wants to die? You know? Uh, 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 he's got another song where the lyrics go something like this, fingers down the throat of love, and the sound he makes after that is kind of like someone's got fish hooks down his lungs and are pulling them out. Nick Cave comes across as the most nightmarish atheist you could possibly believe, you know, see. You know, he has one song, Big Jesus Trash Can. Just brutal, brutal stuff. I mean, it makes the Sex Pistols sound eligible for the Disney Channel. And, um, and, and then later, he starts kind of mutating. So that eventually, he starts singing songs about God, which... Uh, uh, he kind of eventually has kind of a platonic view of God. And uh, and then later, he will kind of drift in and out of these philosophical belief structures. Uh, but the point is this. I could tell when I was listening to the really dark stuff, oh, Nick wants more from life. And I was glad when he started doing kind of blues and, and kind of gospel-related songs. I said, anyone who discovers the blues, dark as they can get, Nick's getting back, to, he's, he's going to push himself back into a, a, some kind of belief in God, which is somewhere where he is today. I don't know if I would call him a Christian at all, but he definitely has some kind of view of God. We'll just put it that way. Uh, we'll call him a theist of some sort, uh, which is interesting, though. You see, so a person can say one thing, and actually deep inside, something else is going on. Also, a person can pass through different variations on these belief structures. And I think we're all essentially tempted by them at different points. So, I can say, I believe in God. I do. I believe, I'm a Christian, and I believe in God. <clears throat> but, that doesn't mean I don't occasionally get this thought. What if it's all meaningless? What if there is no God? What if, you know... Uh, and especially this comes, I notice always, with uh, kind of questions about human relationships. And I think those human relationships, if they reflect back to God, when they go wrong, it means they put something between us and God. Uh, or there are times where, you know, especially in my youth, I was really tempted by what I call the magical process, magical thinking. Uh, so that, you know, I used to uh, write in my journal when, when I first started writing a journal in order to think if I wrote something down, maybe it would be meaningful, not meaningful, maybe it would happen. Like if I wrote about m my liking a girl when I was in junior high school, maybe she would really like me, you see. But that's magical thinking of connecting to this 
force. You know, I also spent a little time as a child, interest as a young boy, uh, not a young boy, but as a you know adolescent, uh, thinking about astrology and such. Again, it's this connecting with this thing force, it, thinking somehow if I could master the the power and the way to do this, things would work out. Um, and there are plenty of times when I've just thought like, you know, I really like just watching movies. I like, uh, uh, you know, listening to music. I like categorizing music. You know, it's just like, ah, uh, it's, sometimes it's just like jeepers. It's why do I have to care about, <laughs> you know, like what all these things mean? And of course that lasts for about five minutes until I watch the next great movie and they're like, wow, that made me think so much. But again, there's a part of us that just wants to disappear into the common and the mundane, to just think about food. I've often thought, man, it would be great if I had four different lives that I could live. A life just to read books, a life just to watch movies, a life just to listen to music and go to concerts, and a life just to write. But instead, I've got to try to put all of this into this life. Ah, what a challenge. <laughs> so, uh, um, okay, what are you doing? Come back. I've got my computer down here and it just shut off. I just broke the fourth wall. But this is nothing but breaking the fourth wall, isn't it? <laughs> so, but think of uh, different people from history. For instance, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, he starts off a communist atheist. You know, he was born uh, around the time of the Russian Revolution, so he didn't know anymore. And then... Uh, you know, he, he was, his grandmother did take him to church a few times. He thought that was kind of pretty. But eventually he became the nice communist atheist uh, adolescent he was supposed to. Eventually got sent off to war, wrote kind of uh, old Stalin's a fuddy-duddy in a letter, got sent off to the gulag. <laughs> you know, 10 years later, plus another few years of exile, I think it was 15 years from the time he left to go to war until he finally got back home. Um, his belief structure totally changed because when you're in prison, you have time to think and you have time to say to yourself, what am I doing here? And it's not just like, it's all Stalin's fault. That'll only get you so far. And that's Solzhenitsyn's big revelation is like, oh no, this is me also participating in the system. This is me also, all of my pride. And so Solzhenitsyn switches from being an atheist to being a believer in God. Um, John Lennon's very interesting. John Lennon switches his belief structure so much it makes one's head spin. Uh, he was raised as an Anglican. Eventually, you know, his religion is rock and roll. So he's, you know, he goes from one down to four, uh, but then becomes like this massive figure in pop culture who then kind of has to say something to the world. Well, then he's like with Yoko Ono. Well, Yoko Ono is very, very clearly a, a number two character. There is no meaning. She's just a avant-garde artist breaking down all, all things. There's, you know, it's just this kind of thing. But then he kind of, and they kind of had differences because he would try to see things in a more, like everything's going to work out. I mean, he, he once uh, in this phase about 1970, 71 said, if there is a God, we're all it. Which means what? Well, it's kind of a thing consciousness. And when he wrote um, the the song Imagine, uh, he was in that sort of thing consciousness. But then, I mean, what, what's also interesting is a lot of people, I remember when John Lennon died, I was in New York City on that day. And uh, at first, I just thought it was, I, it was like I was right before I was about to go to bed and I saw John Lennon's been shot. And I said, someone probably listened to his new album. And I just joked it off because I just thought the new album was not very good at all. It was just sentimental. And, uh, and then when I woke up, I realized, oh my God, John Lennon's been shot. And everything in the whole city was affected by that. But, um, you know, what was strange was that... Uh, Earlier, oh, what was strange was they were playing Imagine all the time. And ever since then, Imagine has been this huge song that people play all the time. And I was always curious as to why they didn't play the song God, which does things like goes on this list of all the things he doesn't believe in anymore, which includes Buddha and Jesus and yoga and, you know, he doesn't believe in Martin Luther King anymore and he doesn't believe in... Uh, 
uh, the Beatles anymore or Bob Dylan. All he believes in is himself and Yoko. Uh, not too many years later, he would... Oh, and, and the song ends with the phrase, him singing it over and over. The dream is over. The dream is over. And that meant the 60s dream. It meant the Beatles dream. It was over. I deal with that in one of my How We Got There series on the 60s. But here's the point. Is that, so you could say, well, you know, he's kind of, uh, by saying it's just him and Yoko, that puts him back down on number four. But he was also kind of this vague, nebulous, if we all just get together, everything's going to work out. Not realizing he'd actually stumbled on the kind of variant on essentially communism that people now believe in. Which is to say, if you think, imagine there's no countries. Hmm. Who else said that? Mr. Marx did, I believe. <laughs> you know? Imagine there's no religion. Oh, yeah. Same thing. And there's a really, one of the most ironic, strange things of all. There's this incredibly dark movie about Cambodia in the 1970s. It was made in the 1980s. And the film was called The Killing Fields. And the director uh, goes and shows. And, and what's happening in Cambodia is that everyone who is anybody is being killed, like all the doctors and lawyers, and anybody who has some special talent is being killed because they're equalizing everyone. And if you're a doctor, you have special talents and special skills, and people will treat you differently. So just kill them all. And so, and, and the story is about this one guy, you know, crawling through this wreckage of the debris of, of Pol Pot's Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge. And at the last scene in the movie, they play Imagine. And I just sat there, and I'm not the only one who saw this, and it just said, like, oh, my God, don't they realize that that song isn't about the hope for a new world of this, this kind of romantic, idealistic world? It is, in fact, the exact same philosophy of communism. So Lenin goes that way. Then... Okay, so you're saying to yourself, well, John Lennon's got Yoko, and he's just going to keep his head down, but sometimes he's going to believe in this thing, consciousness. And then, uh, like, he spends about two years, he, he separates from Yoko, sleeps with, like, some Vietnamese girl, is spending time with uh, Harry Nielsen, the other, the, the, the singer, and they're just getting drunk and wasted, and, you know, two years later, you know, heroin, all the rest of it, two years later. Then in 1977... He, for, for a short time, he's claiming to be a Christian, he, to have connected with the Christianity of his youth. And he's like, you know, the connecting back with Oral Roberts University. It's just crazy. And then finally, he goes back to the keep your head down. It's just me and Yoko. Uh, makes your head spin. But that is something of the messiness of all of these positions in life. So what do you believe? One thing is clear to me is that all of these views cannot be simultaneously true. Um, eventually, we choose or slide into one view or the other. Uh, and I think some of that is based upon just our experiences in life. But we do make choices. I purposely haven't tried to specify which view of God, you know, I haven't tried to break down what's the difference between all of these things. I've mentioned a little bit, but even, even atheists, there are different kinds of atheists. There are people who are just kind of happy-go-lucky atheists. I've met some. Uh, and then there are people who are hardcore atheists who just do not see any meaning in anything. I have much more respect for those people. Uh, I would much rather, you know, read a book by H.P. Lovecraft, who was just like absolutely horrified of the meaninglessness of the world and puts that in all of his strange creation. than I would read some postmodern book about people who, you know, just kind of basically like, yeah, there's no God, but whatever. It's cool. <laughs> you know, guys just like, Pfft. it's just not cool to come to that kind of conclusion in such a it, it, pointless manner. Uh and I purposely haven't tried to convince you of the truth of Christianity, even though I'm a Christian. Um, I haven't tried to talk about the different belief structures. I haven't really tried to pull apart the difference between Hinduism and Buddhism and New Age thought or magic, uh, all of these different things uh, of various occultic forms. Nor have I tried to get into some of the things which get really complicated, like pantheism. 
or Native American religion, which on one hand is very much kind of a connecting below the surface, and yet there's often talk of a god. Um, nor have I tried to discuss something like Gnosticism, which I think is essentially a thing consciousness, though it does talk of God, but on such a remote level that one can never get there. I haven't tried to incorporate everything in here, and or to talk about the negative belief structures like you know black magic or uh, fascism and things like this. Uh, communism can also be seen as a negative belief structure, uh, but the one these views really have had adherence to their beliefs. So uh, I haven't tried to incorporate anything. Nevertheless, I think these four systems are uh, or viewpoints, perspectives are the place. You got to go to one of them first before you can start asking other questions about what's really um, more valid. So what do you believe right now in the kind of stillness of your heart? You know, are you just trying to keep your head down and not think about it? Do you think, ah, there's no God. Let me just try to get through this. You know, I'm basically dealing with monkeys. Uh, do you feel like, you know, well, all the stuff you're talking about is making me a little nervous. I need to get to a yoga class. Or you go like, burn, I totally agree with you. I believe in God, you know, and yet maybe differently than I do. So what do you believe? Well, here's how I, you know, how do you choose what to believe? Because there is an element of choice here. Because obviously there are four different things here and they all can't be true at once. So, the, you know, um, and I'm going to tell you how I come to look at these things. So let's start with, this is how I break it down. Let's start with number four. While laudable for its supposed common sense humility, I think uh, number four, you know, just, just keep your head down and don't think about it, don't ask big questions, is essentially a non-starter. Um, it G.K. Chesterton essentially a years ago, back in the beginning of the 20th century, put this notion of humility in its place. He says, what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. The old humility was a spur that prevented a man from stopping, not a nail in his boot that prevented him from going on. For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which made him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, which will make him stop working altogether. And I think this has been the philosophical progress of the 20th into the 21st century, is that more and more people really don't have a reason for why they do much at all. And so they just stop and get involved with some, you know, fanish, geeky passion and put everything into that. You see this on YouTube all over the place where people, and they're, they're nice people, but they're just, you can tell they're, they're hunkering down and just kind of getting into that little amount of things they can get into without thinking about, don't open up too big of questions, which is one of the reasons why uh, the great questioning films of the middle of the 20th century from, you know, Bergman and uh, Antonioni and Coppola and Tarkovsky and Kieslowski and all these people, why these kind of films don't really resonate the way they used to. is because people today, they want to paint a little smiley emoji face on everything and keep their head down and don't think about it. So, we can take number four off the table as anything serious to really think about. And I would include with that the kind of popular postmodern philosophies that people have. There are serious postmodern questions, but I'm talking about the, the general ironic tenor of postmodernity. Uh, so, number three, that there is something there. There is a thing. So essentially saying that there is some impersonal force or energy or fate in the world. And yet, in most of these systems of belief, there is a direction, something we should be moving towards. 
So whether it's going clear, getting connected, choosing positivity, getting centered, tapping into the power, et cetera, et cetera. If, and, and here's the point. If there is a direction, well, something impersonal would have no direction. There would no, be no reason. Again, one of the big problems with this view is why shouldn't one choose the darkness? You say there's no particular reason. One can get just as much power on the dark side as the light. Um, and so if there is a direction, suddenly personality is back on the table. And you see a lot of this as being kind of weak variations on the personhood of God. If there is a God, then God has a purpose for you. But if there's just a thing, anything you say you should do is pretty much an accidental illusion. It's still in that state of attachment, which you're supposed to be eliminating. If you get down to the really hardcore versions of view number three, you're supposed to transcend or eliminate all vestiges of this illusion to finally erase your personhood and be absorbed back into it. But curiously, all of this language is also purpose-oriented because there's still this thing of, you should do this. You should eliminate the illusion. Well, that, that should thing is a purpose thing. And so, for me... That puts number three aside. It's just kind of a weak variation on number one, ultimately. Uh, it's also quite impossible to put human pain aside as an illusion. And I just know this. And, you know, here's the truth. Whether it's in human relationships and tears, or whether it's sitting under a, a dental drill, as I have once when the Novocaine wore off. It's really hard to consider that an illusion. So, which brings us, basically it comes down to a choice between number one and number two. Either there is someone there, or there's no one there. And uh, so the question for me that finally decides it is whether personality, personhood is real and meaningful, or if it's just conditioning. If you plump on the side that all of what we do, we're just, you know, elaborate monkeys, we're just rats in a cage pushing on pedals to try to get our needs met, if that's how you see it all, and our persons are just kind of like these fluky things, which, yeah, it's great for telling jokes. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how many comedians are kind of atheists. But, uh, you know, because it's great. Uh, it, you know, there's kind of like no one there. Is you can poke holes in everything then and make a lot of good jokes on the foibles of human nature. But, uh, you know, if everything has simply evolved to be this way, although even the word evolution conjures up purpose, and, and I believe it was, uh, who was it? Uh, Huxley, not, not Aldous Huxley, but his grandfather, T.H. Um, Huxley, I believe it was, who said uh, even the word evolution is kind of a theological idea. In other words, as soon as you mention this, because what happens is everyone starts to think evolution towards progress. It's almost impossible. Evolution should just be seen as change. Well, yeah, things change. And they evolve from one thing to the another. It doesn't mean they're any good. You know, it just means they changed. But it's inevitable. Like you see these bumper stickers that say evolve in the form of a kind of a fish with legs to kind of mock the Christians who have the old fish symbol, which I wish they hadn't resurrected that for bumper stickers in America. But the evolve bumper sticker is kind of like saying, you dummies who still believe in God, evolve and get over it which is progress, which is purpose, which is meaning again. And here's the problem. We're all haunted. No matter what you say you believe, you're, we're all haunted by personhood, by character, by meaningfulness, by, you know, our consciousness, our character, our communication, um, you know, love. Well, you know, what is love? 
I don't believe there's actually an atheist in the world who actually believes love doesn't matter. That it's just a monkey thing. You know, it's just sex. That it's just altruism or whatever the hell that is. Uh, enlightened altruism. Uh, uh, enlightened uh, selfishness. I don't really believe people think that. I think when people are hurt in relationships, they're really hurt. Which is why we have all the problems of psychology and such. So for me... Hey, I don't think personality or communication or consciousness or any of this is an illusion. I don't think this is an illusion. I think I'm actually trying to communicate to you. And some of you might understand what I'm saying, and a lot of you probably aren't going to get all of what I'm saying. And that's fine, because communication is difficult. It takes time. And if you really want to communicate with someone, you need to spend time with them in the flesh, Talking, arguing, going back and forth. Every good marriage is like that. Every good relationship is like that. Where it's just, it takes time. It takes difficulty. It takes patience. It takes wrestling. So for me, I plump down on, there is a God. Now, if you've got better reasons why there isn't, fine. You know, and like I say, but I'll bet you're haunted by the other things. You know, their temptations, their hauntings. You know, we can't get away from them. So you may be the best atheist in the world, but you're haunted by the fact that things matter, that there is meaning in the world. You may think, if I just connect with this higher power, but it's a power, it's not a, it's not God, it's not someone who's asking anything of me, but in fact you are haunted by the fact that you should, you do have responsibility. And responsibility is only important if there is someone to be responsible to. Or a day of reckoning. You know, is everything just a random stroke of, you know, just a random throw of the dice? And yet looking at the world as arbitrary is almost impossible. Nothing in the universe really seems uh, arbitrary. I mean, you look around you, you know, and there'll be people who say like, yeah, intelligent design is so stupid. You know, it's just like, it's just another word for creationism. Well, here's the point. Even that person is haunted by the fact that everything means something. And, and they're haunted by the fact that everything connects so well. You know. So, try to folk, uh, you know, if you don't think there is a God, and if, you, and if it comes down to one and two, then try to function as if there is no meaning. Good luck. Therefore, that's where we find ourselves. You know, uh, essentially, and I, I, you know, I think, like I say, I have a lot of respect for people who hold their views honestly. And I don't respect people who don't. Even people who hold the I'm too small, keep your head down philosophy. I can certainly understand that. I have a lot less uh, sympathy for people who hold things falsely. In other words, people who claim to be one thing, but are another. I think that the person who says they believe in God and acts like there isn't one, I got, haven't got a lot of respect for that person. Although I have a bit more respect for the person who claims there is no God, but acts like there is one. You know? And the person who takes uh, view number three, but makes it into this kind of like Western stew of, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, you know, it's just, you know, as long as everything feels good, everything, you know, try to stay positive, all that. I don't have much respect for that belief structure. I have a lot more respect for Zen monks. And I have a lot more respect for Buddhist guru, uh, Hindu gurus than I do for Western New Agers who have kind of, you know, Taken, you know, a little bit of personality from column A, a little bit of meaninglessness from column B, so I can break up my relationships easily. A little bit of uh, a lot, you know, of, of spices from number three, and then lives in number four. Now, nah, I've got no respect there. And I think you need to be honest with yourself. Take some of that honesty from number two and look for number one. So, anyway. <sighs> yeah, I've gone on a long time. But I just had all these things. I could have broken this down into a couple of uh, a couple of discussions, but I just decided now let's just get it all out. And if you have any questions about this or disagreements, uh, feel free to you know do whatever below. I you know I enjoy the conversation. I enjoy the disagreements, honest disagreements. I don't like people who just say like you're you know you're stupid or any variant on that. I don't have 
much respect for that. But I do have respect for people who say like, well, what about this? And what about that? You know? Um, so think about those things. And, um, well, you know, these are strange times, but I find it interesting. It's like the great pause. And for me, it's a great time to think about the meaning. What is the meaning of things? And, uh, you know, you got this time now, think about it. And if, if what I'm doing now has been at all meaningful to you, uh, let me know. And uh, feel free to subscribe, please, to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. And share this video if you think other people need to see it. And uh, if you want to go as far as helping with uh, contributions, there is a PayPal link below. I certainly could use it, but I could also understand if you haven't got the financing right now. Uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, nadromous mean, means swimming against the stream. I'm asking you to swim against the stream and think really differently. We'll be in touch, or at least visually in touch. What does that mean? Soon. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.